Hello, what is up everybody? My name is Julian Powers, or you might better know me as JP. I'm a certified personal trainer through the National Council on Strength and Fitness, and I'm currently in the process of getting my master's in exercise science, uh, and then my doctorate in physical therapy. Um, I still have a long road ahead of me, but those are my career paths. Uh, this is the first episode in my podcast uh, based around the exercise sciences. So this podcast is going to be for anyone who wants to know more about exercise, who wants to just get more knowledgeable in any of the uh, subjects of exercise science, or if you're a trainer yourself or your strength coach yourself. Again, I'm still learning myself. I never claim to know everything. Um, this is a very, very, very broad field. So um, again, I'm still learning myself. Uh, if you're a really knowledgeable person yourself, you'll pro- you're probably still learning uh, today too. Um, you should never cease to learn. But uh, that's the career path that I'm on right now. Um, and just so you guys know, since this is my first, po- first podcast, I'll probably reference this episode at the beginning too, but um, just if, if anyone wants an introduction from me. But I also have a Facebook, a Twitter, a YouTube, and an Instagram. Of those four, uh, the one that I use the least is by far is Instagram. I'm just not super big on pictures right now, um, just because, again, I'm doing a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm going to school full time, um, and then I want to start these podcasts. Uh, I put up Facebook posts regularly, and then I also do YouTube videos. Um, So if you are watching this on YouTube, again, it's not going to be a video. It's going to be just a picture, just so it doesn't take up too much data if you guys want to play this in your car or anything of the sort. But my Facebook is JP Personal Trainer. I have around close to 900 likes on the page, so just type in JP Personal Trainer, um, and then you'll find my page. Again, it'll be the one that's around 900 likes. I have My YouTube is JP Fitness. You can just type it in at the top. I have 98 subscribers as of today. And today is March 19th, 2017. So it'll be, obviously it's going to increase, but that's what I have right now. Um, My Twitter is, my Twitter handle is at JBTheTrainer. So you guys can follow me at that. And then my Instagram is um, JP double underscore uh, personal trainer. So again, all those are linked. You can go on my Facebook uh, page and then go to my Instagram from there if you guys want. Um, All my stuff has JP on it, so it's really not hard to find me. It would do me a big favor if you guys could uh, like those pages, share them with your friends, and uh, follow them. And some of the pages have a follow option where you can follow them and uh, uh, put them so you can see them first. If, Like, for example, Facebook pages have that. If you guys could please do that, I'd really, really appreciate it. Again, I'm really giving you guys these podcasts, um, and I hope you guys really like them. So, uh, yeah, enough of that. We're going to go into today's topics, and that's going to be about intensity, frequency, and uh, volume. So we're going to be talking about, again, those three, volume, intensity, and frequency, and how those pertain to uh, exercise in general, and um, how they will pertain to maybe how you can program or maybe mistakes that you might be making. Um, We'll start with just the general overall. The point of working out or exercise, obviously, is to increase performance, increase muscle mass, um, any of those things. So if you play a sport and you want to um, become faster, become stronger, then those might be... uh, goals that you're doing with the workout program or you just simply might want to add on muscle mass because you want to look better or you're a bodybuilder or maybe you're a strength athlete or a power lifter so when you uh, do a workout program maybe you're making it yourself or you're following a program three of the most important things remember there's a lot of other factors that pertain to uh, exercise such as exercise selection um, or things like that you know um, recovery um, nutrition but three of the most important are volume intensity and frequency For people who don't know, maybe you're someone who's just starting to learn this, um, you're seeing this podcast, volume is basically how much you do, how much work, how much your work you're doing. Work is force times displacement. So basically, to keep it simple, just how much exercise are you doing? Are you doing a lot of exercise or are you doing a little bit of exercise? Some people calculate a volume differently. Um, From what I've seen, most of the time, it's your total reps multiplied by the weight you're using. And you can calculate that by just doing the, all of your reps times the weight, or you can calculate that by just doing reps per set, so reps of the set times how many sets you're doing times how much weight you're doing. And that'll calculate a volume. Intensity, and I have to differentiate this a little bit, but intensity is, is a percentage of your one rep max. So for example, just to keep the number simple, let's just say your max bench press is 100 pounds. You're most likely benching more than that, but just for the sake of this example, um, if your max bench press is 100 pounds, uh, 90, if you let's just say you use 90 pounds, 
during that workout for a bench press, that would be 90% of your one rep max. So the intensity would be 90%. Um, now that's just a, that's a pretty clean number. You might be max benching around something around 250, so it'll be a little bit different, but that's what intensity is, percentage of your one rep max. Sometimes people get this confused with um, RPE, which is rating of perceived exertion. RPE basically means how much effort you give during the set or how many reps you're shy away from failure. For example, in the same example we used, let's just say someone's max bench press is 100 pounds and they, they do, they're they using 70 pounds for that uh, particular set. 70, 70 per, and that would be 70% of, uh, the intensity would be 70%. Now, 70% intensity correlates to around 12 reps, I believe. So if someone stops at 9 reps, even if they stop at 9 reps, it's just 3 reps short of fail what failure would be, That's the intensity is still 70%. Uh, intensity isn't determined by how many reps you do um, once you pick the intensity. So if you're picking uh, 70 pounds and your max is 100, it's 70% uh, is your intensity. But RPE... If you stop at uh, nine reps, your RPE would be about a seven because you're not pushing yourself to go to near failure. So basically, like you could do um, how many reps you are away from failure is basically what's going to gauge your RPE. A simple way to think about RPE is how hard you do during the set. Uh, RPE in the scale is one through ten for RPE. So if you're doing a ten RPE, that means you're going to failure. If you're doing a seven RPE, that means you usually have about two, three reps in, uh, left in the tank, depending on how many reps you're doing total. So just for the sake of the rest of the podcast, when I bring that up, those are the differences between the two. And then frequency is just how often you work out. So if you're someone who works out three times a week, that would be your frequency. Usually people gauge frequency on a weekly basis. So some people might gauge it differently, but I it's almost general consensus to gauge it on a weekly basis. So just starting off with uh, volume. Again, volume is reps times weight, and that will give you your total volume. Um, the main things that I'll point out with people who are making a workout program is that you don't want to do too much, you don't want to do too little. All those are things that are obvious and we'll get more in depth. If you do too little, you're not going to be, you're not going to see any adaptations that you want to see with exercise. For example, if you want to get faster or you want to gain muscle, you won't get faster. If you don't have enough volume, you won't get uh, gain any more muscle if you don't have enough th volume. It's plain and simple. If you want to get good at something or you want to increase something, you just have to do more of it. For example, if you want to get good at a card game, then you need to play more cards. If you want to get good at a video game, you need to play more cards. If you want to, and it comes with exercise, that's where we're headed. If you want to squat more, you need to, if you want to squat more weight, you need to do uh, squat with more weight or you need to do more. That more could be in the form of sets, it could be in the form of repetitions, or it could just be in the form of adding weight on a bar, which is what the simplest, most common way to do that is. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you don't want to do too much. Doing too much can uh, do the same thing. And usually people, I see see people not necessarily overtraining, but they're doing too much that day, that workout, or they're just doing too much in general. But it's, I would say it's generally just too much in that workout is what they're doing. Um, and, and that will lead into frequency in a little bit, or frequency later on. But that's what you're trying to aim with volume is you don't want to do too much you don't want to do too little now you're saying well what am i well what's too much and what too little if you're someone who's never exercised before or you have let's just say you're someone who you're listening to this and you're like oh i'm on and off with working out and i never have a consistent program and i work out maybe three days this week and next week i'll work out one day then i get motivated and i work out four days that week or just one day a week or you're barely working out you could probably do a little 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 volume and still see results because, or let's, like for example, for someone who doesn't work out at all, I'm putting all you guys in the same group, the people who just barely work out or don't work out. You guys could do relatively low volume and still see adaptations. Why? Because you're doing more than what you did before. And if you do more than what you did before, you're going to see some type of adaptations. Now, there is an upper limit, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but basically if you're someone new, if you're doing, if you do anything, that's going to be more than what you previously did. For example, you take someone who's did nothing. Let's just say they've never done weightlifting in their life, and they do two sets of push-ups and two sets of rows. That's it. hypothetically. Let's just say they did. That's it. They are going to see some increases in muscle mass and strength 
over time if they do that. Now, there's going to be a certain point where if they just keep doing that same weight, that same reps, that same amount of sets, and they don't increase anything, that they're going to plateau. But at the beginning, that's enough of a stimulus for them to grow. Okay, you don't need to necessarily need to jump up to 10 sets on chest and 10 sets on back. It doesn't, that's, you're not giving your, your body kind of anywhere to go after that. Um, and that's what kind of volume is. You want proper progressions. Um, so if you're someone who hasn't been working out, I'm not saying that doing two sets on chest is absolutely necessary, but I'm saying you could start with real low volume. You could start with three sets of bench press and three sets of rows for like a chest back day. Or if you're doing like a total body routine, you could just do like three sets on chest, three sets on back, two sets on shoulders, and then one set, one set on biceps and one set on triceps. That right there, and remember, like I said, I'm not creating a long workout program here, but that right there is enough to see and see some type of growth results and you're giving your your you're giving yourself a lot of room to grow later on in the future when you have to increase in volume to see results you get what i'm saying so going from nothing to something that's going to be uh an increase right there so and so if you're someone who's new or you barely worked out or you're trying to get back into it, you don't need to be on a workout program that's hammering you with this or that or 46 yeah there are some good programs out there that might be cookie cutter programs but any program any single program that you're buying offline that's not specifically catering to you they're not asking you how long have you been working out what have you been currently doing um uh, what where when's the last like do you have any past injuries uh are you someone who normally handles more volume um how many years have you been lifting any of those questions then it's not going to be proper i don't care how good of a workout program it is and you could be like well well, I did this workout program. I wasn't working out at all, and I did this workout program, and I seen results. I'm not saying that you can't see results from programs. I'm saying that they might not be the most optimal results that you can see, and then that that might not leave you to see better results later on in the future when you need to have progressions. Um, so again, you don't need to do too much if you're someone who's new, uh, new to lifting. You barely need to do anything at all. Now, if you're someone who's more intermediate, again, it's all about proper progressions, increasing volume over time and not making drastic jumps in, in volume, like going doubling your total amount of volume in, in between one in, one workout and the next. It's increasing slight, slightly over time. Like you maybe you've heard of the five by five uh, workout program where I think they increase five pounds every week on, on whatever lift they're doing. And again, don't quote me on this, I'm not exactly sure how it works, but they increase it by five pounds each week and when they can't get any more, they reduce the volume by five pounds or ten pounds, or they basically deload a little bit once they can't hit the five reps with the increased weight. So, week one they do, let's just say they're doing 150 on a squat. Let's just say it's someone relatively new; they're not really an intermediate. They're 150 on squat each week. They'll add five pounds. Let's just say they get all the way up to 190 pounds, and then they can't hit the five reps. Then they'll scale back to like 180 or 185, and then do five, and then they'll start increasing again once they feel like they're ready or maybe that next week i'm not sure exactly how it goes but the whole point of this is to be able to do proper progressions don't make drastic jumps and you want to gradually increase volume over time to increase the adaptations that you see again volume is the key marker in seeing results if you do not do enough of something whether it's strength whether it's hypertrophy whether it's something for athletics you are not going to see adaptations you can't do less of something and see improvement you might be able to maintain gains if you do less, like a deload phase, but that's not going to help you see any improvements. I've never seen anyone, unless you like increase, if everything, I'm saying if everything else stays the same, um, like if you decrease volume, but then you increase specificity, that might make you increase gains, but I'm, I'm assuming everything else is staying the same. So that again, that's assuming everything else is staying the same. And then with volume, you also have to think about deloading because with volume, you may say, well, okay, well, I'm gradually going to gradually increase volume over time. So do I just keep adding weight, adding weight? But like I mentioned earlier that, let's just say in that squat example, someone added five pounds each week and then one week they couldn't get the five reps. Then they had to scale back and reduce volume by five pounds. So they started at 150, they did five reps that week. The next week they did 155, they hit their five reps. The next week they went to 160, they hit five reps. Then they did that all the way up to 185, and they couldn't get the five reps to 185. Let's just say they only got four. Then they scaled back to 175 or something. Sometimes with volume, you have to deload because pro progress, progression is not linear. Growth in anything is not linear. Um, you're not going to keep going up, up, up forever. It doesn't work like that. Um, 
And sometimes, again, if you did that at the beginning, you'd have way too much volume way too soon in your kind of uh, exercise lifespan. And that again, that's going to span over years and years and years if you plan to work out uh, for as long as you live. So you got to think about that. You got in, in implementing deloads um, is good. One, it can prevent injury. Two, it's going to help you make greater gains in the long run. And this goes back to what I was talking about earlier and how like regular programs that you buy off of YouTube or from a bodybuilder that you see. I'm not saying that they're not good, but and they may incorporate deloads in there, but they don't incorporate deloads pertaining to you specifically. They don't know what type of profile or like what progress or what year you're on lifting. Um, I've never seen a program that covers 30, 40 different types of stages of, of lifters. Barely new, three months in, six months in, nine months in, 18 months in, 24 months in, four years in, pro level. Like, it, I mean, it doesn't, I never seen that. So the fact that I don't see that shows me that that program, I mean, yeah, it might see results, but again, it's not catered to you. So I don't care how good a cookie cutter program is. It's not going to, it's not going to work for everybody. And at a certain level, it's going to be extremely limiting. Now, if you're one of those people who just wants, uh, who just doesn't like thinking or doesn't want to make their own program, or you're not someone who's going to sit there and make your own program, then just hire a personal trainer. That's what I'm saying. Then they can, if it's a good trainer, then they can, make a program for you specifically instead of just buying one online or if you don't want to if you're again if you're saying oh, i don't have enough money to buy pay for a trainer find a good trainer and have him make you a program and if he doesn't ask you questions like i said how long have you been working out things like that doesn't ask you a bunch of questions to know where you're at what your goals are then again then don't go to a different trainer but that'd be the best bet instead of just buying one of those cookie cutter pro cookie cutter programs online um, now to move into an intensity and again, I already explained the difference between RPE and intensity earlier. So again, if you haven't heard that, you could rewind it and go to the beginning when I explained the difference between RPE and intensity. And again, intensity, volume, and frequency, because that's what we're talking about today, they all intertwine. When you've probably seen it before, when one goes up, the other has to go down, or they all need to be low to moderate. Well, the whole point is that they need to balance out. You can't have all of them high. You can't have intensity high. RP, and I guess you can kind of count RPE as its own thing, but I'm just grouping that up into intensity too. But I'm going to talk about it like it's its own thing. You can't have volume high, intensity high, RPE high, and then uh, frequency high all at the same time. If you do, that's going to lead you to overtraining. First overreaching, then overtraining, and uh, you're just not going to make gains. And and that's a worst case scenario. Um well, I mean, absolute worst case scenario is you have overtraining, which leads to hormonal imbalances, which can lead to long term things like depression, not being able to sleep, things like that. So, again, and for people who don't know, I'll just say it quick overtraining is just a, a state that your body is in where you have pushed your body so much with working out, you have gotten past the point where your body cannot recover from the workouts. And no, overtraining is real. It is not under nutrition, it is not under recovery. Yes, I know a lot of people, it's kind of hard to overtrain. I've heard some people say it's easy. It's not necessarily hard. but And yes, some, a lot of the times it can be other things too. It can be stress, or too much stress from outside sources. It can be lack of sleep. It can be lack of good nutrition. But with all else held same, let's just say someone has no stress. No, They're not fighting with their wife or girlfriend or boyfriend. They're not uh, having trouble with school. They don't have problems with bills. They're getting great sleep, good nutrition. They're, you can still overtrain in that case. Um, now, if everything's in check, then that kind of gives you more uh, ability to train. It gives you, you can handle more volume. You can handle, you can basically recover better because we kind of, our body pulls from like the same pool when it deals from stress. All stress is kind of the same in our body, uh, with our body. So when you get stressed out due to work or when you get stressed out due to a working out or when you get stressed out due to grades, it's kind of all the same thing with our body. Our body just deals with it. Stress kind of all intertwined lead it, it's it's all it kind of pulls from the same pool so just think of it like that so with overtraining you got to remember that you can overtrain and you can't have volume intensity and frequency too high so and or rpe too high so back to intensity again intensity uh it's relatively uh i would say it's it's kind of related to uh, specificity basically what your goal is um now, if you're someone who, if you're a strong man or if you're a power lifter, obviously a good chunk of your training has to have high intensity, which means you have to have be lifting with heavy weights. 
Um, if your goal is hypertrophy, I would still recommend lifting with a portion of heavy weights. Um, it's a different rep range. Uh, there was a study done by Brad Schoenfield. You can look it up if you want. Um, uh, again, it's by Brad Schoenfield. Just type in, I guarantee you on Google, type in Brad Schoenfield comparisons of hypertrophy with power lifters and higher rep ranges. Boom, you're going to be like the first thing that pops up. They did a study with power lifters and, or basically, they took a group who had power lifting style, heavy weight, three reps, and then you took, they took another group with the typical bodybuilding style, the 8 to 12 reps, and they held the volume constant, which means they both did the exact same volume, which is, again, reps times weight. And surprisingly, they both gained the same amount of muscle mass, but because but the group that trained heavier because of specificity, were they lift stronger, which basically means if you lift heavy weights and another person doesn't lift heavy weights, but you have the same amount of volume, then because you're lifting heavy weights, you're going to be the stronger person. But because volume is a key marker when it comes to anything, getting stronger, gaining muscle, because the volume was held constant between the two groups, they both gained the same amount of muscle mass. So basically for someone who's a bodybuilder, do not ignore uh, heavy training. I've heard very big bodybuilders that I, and again, I'm not going to start calling out names, but I've heard very big bodybuilders talk kind of crap on, oh, you shouldn't be training below six reps or you should be training higher than this reps or don't ever strength train. No, that's not true. It's mostly it's most likely because they're on as some type of anabolic hormones, um, steroids that let them train in inadvertent ways versus natural lifters that they can basically do almost anything and they're going to see ridiculous amounts of increases in muscle mass. So for natural lifters, um, you don't, for natural lifters, you got to train a little bit differently. You can't, you can't have a one specific rep range and think that you're not going to gain muscle with other rep ranges. So again, so intensity is like I said, it's it's very specific. So if you're, and by specific, I mean depending on your goals, you need to train at different intensity. So someone who's getting wants to get strong, you in any lifts you got to lift heavy. If you're training for hypertrophy, you're probably better off with a wide range of rep ranges, but not if, if I had to give you any caveats or anything that I'm not sure if I'm even using that word right, but but if I had to give you any kind of type of exceptions, don't go too light. Now, I'm not saying too light is bad. There are some studies that show that maybe high rep, uh, high repetition exercises supersetted with heavy ex exercises first. For example, if you did a heavy bench press, five rep maxes followed by something real light with the bench press right after, supersetted with it, um, like a 20 rep max or 25 reps after. That can increase uh, muscle mass versus just doing the heavy set or just doing the light set by itself. But I wouldn't go too high for a good chunk of your work. Don't, if you're going above 20 reps for a good chunk of your work, that's probably not, not viable. Um, again, you can look this up too in percentages of one rep max. Just type it in on Google. Again, I'll try to link some of this stuff, but there's a lot of studies, so I'd be linking dozens of things. I guarantee you, type it in on Google. Type in uh, uh, percentages of one rep max with effects in hypertrophy study, and it's going to come up. Generally, if you're between 60 and 100% of your one rep max for the majority of your work, you are going to gain muscle. If you start going too low, 50% intensity, 40% intensity for the majority of your work, you are not going to see optimal increases in hypertrophy. So if you're above 60% intensity, and you get a wide variety of rep ranges, rep ranges, your intensity is basically set. You're good right there. For strength athletes, again, a good chunk of your work needs to be uh, from the heavier the heavier rep ranges and higher intensities. Not too much, though. Back to the Brad Schoenfield study. Again, check out Brad Schoenfield, all his stuff. Uh, a real smart guy. Again, he's a big impact on the exercise science fitness industry. I'm a real cool guy. I've seen him on a lot of videos. So, But in that Brad Schoenfield study that compared the heavyweight low reps to the uh, bodybuilder, typical bodybuilder rep ranges, they, had, they showed the same amounts of increases in muscle mass. Um, the powerlifting group did get stronger because of specificity. But what's surprising is that because the, the powerlifting group lifted heavy for the same amount of volume, they ended up a lot more fatigued and drained at the end. I think it was an eight-week cycle. Don't quote me on that. Eight-week eight cycle that the study lasted. But at the end of the eight weeks, uh, the powerlifting group, they were extremely, extremely fatigued, like gas, tired. They didn't want to do the study anymore. Basically saying, okay, I'm done. The group that was doing the hypertrophy training, they uh, they weren't gassed anymore. They actually 
they were told the people who were doing the study on them or who they were doing the study for said, oh, I could have done more. I want to train more. I like studying. But because they had to keep the volume constant between the two groups, they couldn't let them do more because then it would be different and then it would skew the results. So basically what that shows is that, and I'm pretty sure there are other studies that show this, what that shows is that uh, that uh, training too heavy for too many sets or too much volume at super, super high intensities is not beneficial to, uh, or can maybe get, get you more susceptible to overtraining. So get, remember, you don't want to be too specific when it comes to specificity. I'll, remember, and for people who don't know, specificity just means training and what you're trying to do. You have to train on how you're going to train. For example, if you're playing chess, if you want to get better at chess, you got to play chess. You can't get better at chess by playing a card game. It might sound uh, very ridiculous. You think, oh, no, you know, no shit. If you want to play chess, you got to play chess. Well, with exercises, some people can try to do weird, fancy things. You know, if you want to get better at the squat, you need to squat. If you want to get better at a deadlift, you need to deadlift. But if someone's like, okay, well, if I want to get stronger, I should always stay in the heavy rep ranges. Well, no, because there are other consequences of that, which is I'm trying to show, tell you right now with that study that was done, is that if you're trying to be strong, yes, a good portion or maybe even the majority of your work, two-thirds of your work, needs to be in, it could be a give or take, 15%, 10%, um, maybe half to 60% 60, 60 of your work needs to be generally heavy, but you can't do that for the entirety of your work because then you might be overtraining. Look at, again, that's referencing to the study that I'm talking about. The guys who did the heavy weight low reps, they just were gassed. They were done. So... And this goes back to volume. I'm tying intensity back to volume. If one of, and like I said earlier, if one of the key drivers in hypertrophy is volume, which is reps times weight, and you think, okay, well, I need to get total. Uh, the more volume I do, and remember, and this is with with in, intelligent volume. I mean, I don't mean oh, do 100 million sets with with exceptions. But if you have someone who's doing heavy weight, and they're okay, let's just say you take two people and they're trying to gain for uh, train for gaining muscle or hypertrophy and then one group is training heavy and then half heavy half of uh, the typical 8 to 12 body bodybuilding rep ranges and then you have another group who does 33 percent of the work heavy a third and then they do the rest with typical bodybuilder rep ranges now there's nothing super magical about the bodybuilding rep ranges there have been a ton of studies like the one I just talked about with Brad Schoenfield showing that the bodybuilder rep ranges don't promote any increased muscle mass over maybe different rep ranges like the powerlifting rep ranges, the heavy heavier rep ranges. Um, but the bodybuilding rep ranges is what they do let you do or anywhere around that rep range, not just 8 to 12 reps. It could be like 7 to 14. Anywhere around there is going to let you get more volume without being as fatigued as it, in comparison to someone doing heavy, heavy weight all the time. So in that comparison I just did right there with the one group doing half heavy weight, half bodybuilding, typical 8 to 12 weights, then another group doing 33% volume with heavy, heavy weight, like three rep maxes, or not three rep maxes, but just around three reps heavy weight, and then the 66% uh, bodybuilding 8 to 12 rep ranges. The second group with the 33% and 66% is probably going to see better increases because they're going to likely be able to do more volume, total reps times weight, without getting as fatigued as the other group who maybe has more uh, uh, more heavy weight in it. Now, that was just an example. Someone could train half and half and see amazing results. But what I'm saying is, you can't sit there and say, "Well, I'm going to train heavy all the time if volume if volume's a key, and I want to get strong at the same time." Because you're going to end up in a fatigue state. Basically, it's easier to get more volume when you're looking at hypertrophy when you have a little bit, maybe more of a uh, typical bodybuilding rep ranges. It's easy to get volume that way. You don't feel as fatigued, and that's shown in that Brad Schoenfeld study, the group that did. The volume was held constant. One group did the powerlifting style. One group did the bodybuilding style. But the group that did the bodybuilding style training, they wanted to do more. The fact that they were ready and willing and happy and they wanted actually said, oh, I want to do more. That's great. I mean, if someone's seeing results and they told you, they had the, remember, they had the same uh, uh, gains in muscle mass. So if you have one person who's saying, oh, I'm seeing great gains, but and I feel like I want to do more. And then you have another person who's saying, I'm seeing gains, but I'm done. I'm tired. You don't want that. So typically... You got to take that into account too with intensity. You got to balance things out. Um, so typically, you don't want to go too heavy a ton and a ton and a ton of time. Which I see people, and I did this before too. I see people maybe go too low of a rep range. Like when I wanted to do heavy work, I would maybe do like 
not necessarily maxes, but the RPE was pretty high, and I would do two reps, two reps. So basically, those two reps were really, 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 really hard. Um, and maybe I could have possibly got three, but even then, like the fact that it's only possible that I could get three reps, training with a two rep range, two reps, basically pick a squat, like during a squat, for example, pick a weight that you could only do for two reps. And I would do that every week for like my first three or four sets. That's just too heavy. I remember I was super fatigued. And, and remember, you have to think about volume too. Now, if I cut the weight back just a little bit and I'm able to do five reps, which equals more volume, that's going to help me make better strength gains because you got to think five rep maxes or around five rep maxes, maybe a little less than max because you don't want the RPE too high. Um, it's it's going to equal, it's still strength training and then it's going to equal more volume, which is going to help you make more adaptations in the long run. And that, that was intensity and that leads into RPE, which is rating of perceived exertion. Um, and that just basically means how hard you're trying to set. So for example, you could take your absolute four rep max. Let's just say you were pick a squat, for example. You pick a weight that you know for a fact you could only get four reps. If you had a gun to your head, you could not get another rep. You could only get four reps. Let's just say that's with 225, and you could only get four reps. You could not get another rep no matter what. So you cannot get five reps, then four reps is absolutely the hardest you can do. Four reps would be an RPE of 10. Basically, you went as hard as you could go, and you could not get any more. Now, generally, I would not recommend training like that for all of your training. And this is where I feel like I made my biggest mistake when I started personal training, when I started studying stuff. Now, you you might be saying, oh, well, if you don't train as hard as you can on every set and give it everything you all, then you're not going to make any growth. You're not going to – you have to push your body past your limits. No, that's – that's that's not – more and more studies have are coming out, and we are learning more and more in depth as – you know, humans and about exercise and exercise sciences, that that's not how it it's that's not going to give us the most growth in whatever goal that we're trying to reach, whether that be hypertrophy, strength, or getting faster. I'll try to post a study down below. Again, there's a lot of studies. Um, a lot of these studies I'm getting from, just so you guys know too, they're really really cool people, really really smart. Um, there's a page called Strength and Conditioning Research on Facebook. Look them up. They're really 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 uh. It's a good page, a great page. They post pictures that show studies that they do. They're, it's one of the best pages I've ever seen. Um, sh that's one guy, one group that you guys can look up. Greg Knuckles is another one. Very smart guy, extremely smart. Um, I'm pretty sure he's going to graduate school. He's going to start going to graduate school for exercise uh, physiology. But he does a lot of stuff. He's written dozens and dozens of guides and articles on uh, lifting. Um, Omar Isuf, who works with Greg Knuckles a lot. He's on YouTube. If you watch YouTube, you've probably seen him. Him and Greg Knuckles work a lot together. Um, and so far, those are just the main ones. But definitely, a lot of the stuff, or the studies I'm getting, and obviously I've read their books and stuff, um, go check them out. But yeah, a lot of the studies I'm getting are from there. You can read their text. But but yeah, the study, uh, the study that I'm talking about in regards to RPE is that they took a group that did an RPE of 10. They trained a failure on every single, uh, uh, every single set. And then they took another group that trained an RPE of an eight, which means they stopped two reps shy of failure. I'm pretty sure volume was constant, regardless if it was or wasn't. No groups showed increased amount of muscle mass or strength over the other group. And I think the group that did go to failure each each repetition did show increases in muscular endurance, which makes sense. I mean, if you're training to failure, you're going to have more muscular endurance. But most people who are trained are looking to gain muscle or they're trying to get stronger. And the group that went to the RPE of 10 did not get stronger or gain muscle more in any way. And on top of this, the group that trained to failure had increased cortisol levels. I think it was at, a, at the end of the eight-week period. Eight week period. Most of these studies I, I see that are, are eight weeks. So I'm not just saying eight weeks over and over. A lot of them that I read are eight weeks. But so that's the study right there that showed that training to failure does, for most people who are training for that, they don't see any increases in strength or muscle mass. And that's showing signs of overtraining. Think about it. Increased cortisol levels with no increases over another group. What's the point of doing it? You're just increasing stress hormones. That's what cortisol is. It's a stress hormone. It breaks down muscle tissue, things like that. So, again, I'm not an endocrinologist. I don't know too, too much about cortisol, but it is a stress hormone. I mean, uh, you don't want – if you, that's the predominant hormone that's going on in your body post-workout over the more anabolic hormones, uh, that's not good. And especially if you have another group who's not training as hard as you um, and they're – seeing the same results. And remember, an RPE of 8 isn't train not training hard. 
think about it. To failure, that's where you automatically been feeling the burn for a few reps. So basically, you might feel the burn and a few reps before you know you're going to hit failure stop. But basically, like in that squat example that I used of a four rep max squat, you don't need to train to gun to head mentality all the time. You don't. If anything, that can increase um, that can increase the chances of you overtraining. So it's not it's not good to do that every set, and I definitely wouldn't recommend it. Now, there are some instances where if you're going lightweight, you're and you're training for let's let's say you're saying well, I'm going lightweight and I'm training for metabolic stress because the key drivers for muscular growth are metabolic stress and mechanical tension, which leads to muscle damage, which leads to uh, you gaining muscle or getting stronger. So you might think, okay, well, I'm going to go high reps do to get some uh, metabolic stress. Now, if you're going high reps and you're only doing it for specific sets and it's higher reps, I, I would say, okay, that makes sense to maybe go to failure that rep. Or maybe if it's like the last set in your, uh, just the last set, in whatever exercise you're doing, you might want to go to failure. Um, then yeah, that's that's okay. Just to make sure you're getting the gains that you want. But I wouldn't recommend doing it every set. And then I especially wouldn't recommend it even on the last set of strength exercises, exercises or power exercises, like extreme power exercises that you're doing. And by power exercise, I don't mean power lifting exercises. I mean like things like the snatch, the clean and jerk, or even just basic exercises like the spar, the deadlift. Why I don't recommend going RPE of ten. Almost never, unless it's competition or unless you're doing really, really, really lightweight. And even then, like, I, certain ones I wouldn't do it, like snatch, clean and jerk. I would never recommend going to an RPE of 10 ever. Squat and deadlift, I would only recommend going to an RPE of 10 if it's, like, really, really, really lightweight. And, I mean, it's still it's hard to find an example why. And the main reason why I wouldn't is because just due to the increases in chances of injury. It's a compound movement. You know, there's a lot of things going on during a squat. There's a lot of things going on to the, during a deadlift. If you push, there's no point in going to that RPE of 10 on those. I really doubt it. Unless it's a competition, which is completely different. But even then, like, you regularly see, like, when you see powerlifters lift heavy weight for a uh, me or, or like, even record-breaking attempts, you never see them stuck in the middle of a squat for five seconds. It's usually, it might be slow, but because they're such advanced with their technique, it's a relatively smooth rep. So... So again, you you never see them like struggling to get the weight up like on a squat or a deadlift for three, four seconds. So yeah, sometimes you do. But again, that's just increasing the risk of injury. You're increasing risks for causing a lot of things. So yeah, unless it's a competition, I wouldn't recommend training uh, an RP of 10 or even maybe like not even a 99.5. So basically if it's a compound movement, what I would do, and the, this is the best rule of thumb that I could probably give you is don't think of absolute failure. Think of form failure. So when you feel your form is compromising in any type of way, like you feel like, okay, you know, then stop. Now, there's an exception. If you're like, well, I feel like my form is perfect even until I hit absolute failure and I can't get another rep. Then I would say just stop two reps shy, two, two, three reps shy of failure. You don't need to go to failure. You'll still see growth. Again, like that study I talked about, you can look it up yourself or I'll try to post it down below. You're not going to see any decreases in gains. So for RPE, again, Control RPE. You don't have to go to, oh, I have to get push myself to get every single rep on every single set. Yes, if you want to make sure that you're 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 seeing the results you want to see, or you want to make sure you're pushing yourself as hard as you need to be pushing yourself, then I would recommend uh, maybe just the last set of an exercise go to an RPE of 10. If it's not like a snatch, clean and jerk, a deadlift, or a squat. If it's like bench press, um, like a curl, an overhead press, or if it's things like aren't very, very, very tasking on your body or have a likelihood for increased risk of injury, then yes, maybe the last set of an exercise, you can go to an RPE of 10. Or if you're going really, really, really high reps, then because so, if it's such a high reps and it's such a light, which means it would be a lighter weight, then it's the increased, uh, the chance for injury, like risk is really low. So in those instances, I would. You just got to think about that. Um, in relation to the other two um, programming components. And the last one, which we're going to go into, is frequency, which uh, it's fairly simple. It's the more simple of the ones, which yeah, I, I think it is. Um, frequency just means how often you, you work out. And again, this is usually talked about on a weekly basis. So if someone says, like, oh, my frequency is two or three, they're working out that muscle group twice or three times a week. Um, they'll usually say per week anyways. But And what I recommend in this, and which is the typical thing that I would see, um, which not what I recommend. What I see typically is 
people usually work out a muscle group one time a week, which, again, if you're someone who goes on YouTube enough, you've probably seen yourself that you shouldn't do that. But if you don't go on YouTube a lot or if you don't read stuff, I would, I would not recommend uh, training a uh, muscle group uh, just once a week. Well, why is that? Protein synthesis in humans, protein synthesis, the window after we're done working out, the time that our body rebuilds muscle tissue to gain more muscle only lasts about 36 hours. Sometimes I've heard or read it up to being up to 48 hours, but you could say 24 to 36 hours is your protein synthesis window. Basically, that's the, the period of time that you're going to increase muscle mass or make adaptations to that workout that you did. So basically, you work out because you want to get stronger or you work out because you want to gain muscle. Basically, the 36 hours after you're done working out is the window where that those increases take place. That's it. That's all you have. So if you're doing uh, working out one time a week, it doesn't matter how much you work out on that day. Now, again, I'm talking about for natural lifters, not for uh, someone taking anabolic hormones or things like that. But if you're working out uh, one time a week and you're a natural lifter, it doesn't matter how much you're working on the day or how hard you work out or how much of volume you do on that one day or how high your intensity is or your RPE is. It doesn't matter. You're not going to make gains past a day and a half to two days after max. Um, so so that's why it's better to ink work out more than one week. If you, you can kind of think of this as like growth cycles or like cycles where you increase muscle mass. You probably heard that before. I've heard a bunch of people say it. Um, but... When you work out, you increase whatever you're trying to do. Then you want to work out as soon. If you're looking for, remember, this is just for optimal gains. So if you if you want to uh, make optimal gains, you want to work out almost as soon as possible as you can after you feel after your body's fully recovered. So basically, that would come down to every other day or approximately three or four times a week or 3.5 times a week if you wanted to be exact. But just for the sake of people and how weekly schedules work out, I would say three times a week is like one of the absolute if I had to give a number, it would be the most optimal time that I would want someone to work out. Um, just because, again, it when you're looking at protein synthesis and the amount of times you want to make gains per week, that's typically best. Now, if you wanted to get it to absolute perfect, like let's just say you're someone who's more nitpicky and you want to make the best gains you can, it would be every other day. Every other day. So it would be so one week it would be three times. Let's just say it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. Well, actually, that would be four times. Then it would be Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and then it would start on Monday again. So it would be four, three, four, three, four, three, which would be every other day. Um, so that would be kind of maximizing. Now, there are some studies, and some people can say, and you probably heard this too, and again, a lot of the stuff that I'm saying, it's not definitive. It's different because everyone's different. For, and this talks... And everything I'm saying is going to relate to, and this goes back to the beginning with the cookie cutter programs. Not one program is going to fit everybody. I don't care what anyone says, it doesn't work. There are some small caveats here and there. Like, obviously, there's probably not going to be any human that ever exists who could do 200 sets in one workout program. That's just an exaggeration, but I'm trying to make a point. But there are some workout programs that have some people doing certain exercises, specifically the squat, for example, um, six days a week which is a lot. So basically, they're doing them every single day except Sunday, I believe it was. And there are some people who can make gains on that. Now, these people that it happens to, there are specific types of people. One, they're pro-level weightlifters or athletes or they've been working out for years and years and years and years so they can handle this type of volume and frequency. Two, uh, these people, again, uh, even though they handle this type of frequency and volume and intensity and they've been doing it for years, they're just, they're genetically, they, they fit doing this. They must have a really uh, their biomechanics just be must be really well fit to squat. Some people just aren't made to squat. These people must be made to squat because me, I'm not really built for squat. Squat's not really my thing. Deadlifts come easier to me. And so when I do squat too often or too much or too frequently or try to push the RPE too high on a squat, I tend to hurt myself. Not hurt myself. Just get, I mean, by not by hurt, like major injury. In that case, I wouldn't do squats. But I tend to maybe get a little low back pain or, Maybe knee pain because I had surgery on my knee a few years ago. Things like that, you know, just little things. But that's just me. Some people aren't built to squat. So on top of having, you, ha you have to have a lot of experience with weightlifting. You usually have to be built to squat. If you're not built to squat or you ever get aches and pains and you can't get ass to grass or deep in a squat, well, you're probably not going to be able to do six days a week squatting. But some people, the point on point is some people can do that. Some people have squatted six days a week. Some, very, this is, remember, this is, if anything, I should say very few people have squatted uh, six days a week, and they've made great gains on it. You never know. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing that for most people. I just wouldn't. Most, a lot of even elite level lifters don't lift squats that much, just due to the little 
the one you're giving your really your body no time to recover and again that's why you're just genetically gifted if you can do that and you're not on gear or you're not taking steroids but i would recommend like i said generally i would recommend three times a week that is like a magic number now and yeah if that's what i would typically keep it at three times a week. that's just me give or take a day that's up to you but i would definitely keep it at three times a week that would be my good number now, if you're going to adjust something else, let's just say you might be asking, well, what if you're a new lifter? What if you're an advanced lifter? Again, if you're an advanced lifter, I just talked about that. Some people can do six days a week squatting. Wow, if you're one of those people, and again, it's hard to judge other people's opinions on this because if you, I don't know, it'd be hard to sit there and trust someone when they say, oh, I, squ I can squat six days a week because even if you can't squat six days a week and be okay, that's hard for me. I would want to see that you, if you've tried three days a week before and, and you couldn't make better gains doing that. I've rarely met anyone who could squat six days a week versus three and not make better gains doing the three days a week. But you may be asking, well, what if I'm a new lifter? Do I train two days a week? What, what if I'm a, what if I'm two years in? Do I train three days a week still? I typically would still say to train a muscle group three times a week. You could go to two, but again, you got to look at protein synthesis again. Even if you train two days a week, you're kind of still leaving that out. Remember, everything I'm talking about is optimal. If you're like, well, I can only train a muscle group twice a week because of time and my job. And Okay, that's different. That's fine. You don't want to increase your stress outside of working out. Or you, you don't want to make your life harder outside of working out because of working out. If that's what you can't do because you're working, that's okay. But what I, what I was just, I'm just talking about for optimal, making the most gains, typically I would say three times a week. If you're going to adjust anything, I would say adjust uh adjust your volume for those days so if you're a new lifter you don't really like i t like i said at the beginning you don't need to do that much you can do two three sets on a muscle group bam you're gonna make gains especially if you're working out three times a week you could just do two sets on a muscle group that's it one exercise one different exercise each day one day you could have a, ca a low cable chest fly and one day you can have a bench press and then one day you can have an incline dumbbell press boom three exercises one uh one for uh, isometric because it's a fly, one for a flat bench press standard, and then one for an incline, which is good. The low cable fly will target more low chest. So those are three different exercises, two sets each day that you could just do for that one particular muscle group. Um, you might do back and shoulders too on those days, but that would be enough for a beginner. I would still say do three days a week. Um, just decrease the volume. Uh, don't go really high RPE. You really don't need to go high RPE at all. Stop two, three reps short of failure, and then you'll still make really really good gains um again frequency doesn't even need to change too too much now there might be certain times where you change frequency on a very i'm talking about general i'm not talking about specific like a specific some people could train six times a week um another specific maybe you got a competition coming up and you're a power lifter that might change your frequency i'm talking about for the general person for the person in the middle of a program a good number to to stick with is three times a week that's what i train for muscle groups now for legs i train twice a week again this is an exception because i had the i had a surgery on my knee i'm not built to squat so i don't squat too often sometimes I get low back pain from either deadlifts or something just again it could just be the injury i had but doing legs twice a week is better than a lot of people and then it's it's good enough for me to make gains still now three times a week might be absolutely optimal but again what is optimal when i'm hurting you know so that doesn't really matter so just to tie all these in and to kind of close it out again can't really think about one and not the other if your volume's super high like i said if your volume's super high you can't uh you can't do you're not going to make any more gains with with doing 30 sets on chest versus someone who's doing um not 30 sets on chest so if someone's doing uh hypothetically 15 sets on chest and someone's doing 30 sets on chest in one day uh the 30 sets on chest you only can grow so much in that 36 uh 36 hour window post workout and for 99.9999% of people i would say 30 35 sets is way too much in one simple day way beyond way too much in one day for you to be able to grow in that 36 hour window so the more i, I i'll give you a good analogy let's just say i give you two let's just say i gave you three hours to dig a hole with with uh with a tractor i gave you i taught you how to use a tractor and i said dig a hole in three hours as much as deep as you could dig a hole but i but i told you that after you're done digging the hole you have to fill it back up with a shovel not with the tractor with the shovel and you only have 36 hours to fill the hole back up so if you dig too deep of a hole you're not going to be able to fill the hole back up with the shovel in the 36 hours that i'm going to give you and if you can't fill the hole back up i ain't giving you no i ain't giving you any money if you can dig but the deeper hole you dig the more money you'll get 
So you kind of got to think, okay, well, if I dig the hole too deep um, and I can't fill it back up completely, I'm not going to get whatever money I get. But if I don't dig the hole deep enough, then I'm not going to maximize the amount of money that I get. So that's that's ex that's a perfect way to think about uh, train training with volume and, and balancing of volume, intensity, and, and frequency. Is if you dig too deep of a hole by working out too much in one day, you're not going to be able to fully recover on that 36 hours, which those are wasted sets. And that's that's not a good scenario. They're wasted sets and they don't give you any benefits. Or worst case scenario, they lead you to be overtraining a little bit, which is, I mean, you don't want to overtrain. Nobody wants to overtrain. That's going to lead to things like, in worst case scenario, depression, um, irritability, not being able to sleep, lack of appetite, and you're trying to stay away from that. Um, so, but at the same time, and and like I said, a not so worst case scenario, you just don't make the gains that you want, and you're wasting time on the gym. Why waste time in the gym and increase injury risk and increase your chances of overtraining? So, you need to control volume on that specific day. Frequency, again, it ties into frequency too. You don't want a ton, a ton, a ton of volume, like 30 sets in one exercise, because you're going to be doing it more often. The more often you do something with the, again, this is just my magic number. There are differences. I'm not saying that there aren't differences. Everyone's different, but. If you're training a muscle group three times a week, you're getting such a good frequency that, boom, the second you're done recovering, you're training it again. Boom, the second you're done recovering, you're training it again. Um, and then when it comes to, again, intensity, you can't train too heavy, and you have to think of specificity. Um, if you lifting heavy for, let's just say you're an Olympic weightlifter, if you're not training in the uh, proper intensities for what you're going to be, if you never, ever, ever train heavy for your lifts to keep proper technique, and you're always doing 15, 20 rep maxes, if it comes to the day of competition, you're not going to be used to lifting any heavy weight with a snatch and clean and a jerk. So you got you got to think of specificity when it comes to intensity, and you got to think of fatigue when it comes to intensity too, and what your goals are. So you can't even if you are a power lifter and you're doing the squat, bench, and dead, and you're going to be lifting heavy on the competition day. You can't lift heavy all the time due to fatigue in the study that I talked about. So balancing all three of these is extremely important. Again, it's different per individual. That's why cookie cutter programs. They, they, in the long run, they don't work. They're going to stall your progress. Or even if you see great results with them, you say, man, I see great results with this. Well, you could see great, better results either making your own program or or maybe, like I said, get with a trainer. That trainer who did that cookie cutter program, maybe he's making it for people who don't want to do anything else. But it's, it's a, I, again, there's such a lot of things with cookie, pro, cookie cutter programs that can go wrong. But... Again, that's volume, intensity, and frequency. If you have any questions, you can go back to the beginning of this podcast and uh, message me on any of those social media outlets. I would recommend Facebook. That is the best um, thing to message me on. Please follow me on those social medias to share my stuff. Um, I'd really appreciate it. Again, my name is Julian Powers. This is my first podcast. Um, and then until next time, my first podcast, or my next one will probably be in uh, a, few a few weeks. Um, I'm probably going to maybe change up my podcast with my youtube videos back and forth so i'll do an actual live youtube video of me in the video and then i'll do a podcast next week um so again i really appreciate your time until next time see you